All right, thanks everyone for your attention. I'm Lieutenant Colonel uh, Joel Rayburn. I'm an Army officer assigned to the National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies and also an adjunct fellow here with uh, Peter Bergen's counterterrorism program at the New America Foundation. Um, having had a, a, a very excellent series of overall net assessments of Al Qaeda a decade after 9 11 today, and having heard a number of our ex experts make references to the increasing value to Al Qaeda Central of the regional franchises that have branched out since 9-11. Uh, we're fortunate now to have a panel that's very well equipped to give us an in-depth look at several of the most prominent of those franchises. Uh, beginning with uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Filiou, who is here to speak about Al-Qaeda's affiliates in North Africa. Uh, professor Filiou uh, teaches at the Sciences Po in Paris and is a visiting professor at Columbia uh, this year, so we're lucky that he's here in the States for this occasion. He's the author of a number of books on the Middle East and Islamism, and his book Apocalypse in Islam was awarded the main prize by the French History Convention. Uh, he's also put his scholarly expertise into good official practice in a variety of diplomatic posts for the French government, including as a diplomatic advisor to the French Prime Minister, but most recently as Deputy Chief of Mission at the French Embassy in Tunis. So he's therefore supremely qualified to comment not just on Al-Qaeda's affiliates in North Africa, uh, but also the changing political context that surrounds them. And in fact, we eagerly await his forthcoming study on the 10 lessons from the Arab Revolution, which will appear in July. Um, Professor Phil Yu uh, it typifies this panel in that he's not just a scholar, but he's been a practitioner who has been able to have a number of, of uh, field experiences where he put his academic expertise into practice. Uh, that's true of all of our panelists, including uh, Chris Bosek, who is here from the Carnegie Endowment down the street, where he is an associate in, the, uh, in Carnegie's Middle East program. And his research focuses on security challenges in the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa. And he's here today to talk to us about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, he previously worked as a media analyst at the Saudi Embassy here in D.C., putting his scholarly expertise into practical uh, use. And he was also a fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, uh, uh, those of you who know, is one of the U.K.'s premier think tanks. And he remains, uh, he remains an associate fellow there. As, and he was also uh, uh, employed during that time as a security editor for Jane's. Uh, Chris is a recognized expert on de-radicalization and rehabilitation programs for Islamist militants, and he's also done particularly noteworthy uh, work on terrorism in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, from my perch inside the U.S. government, I, I can attest to uh, Chris's value as a frequent consultant and advisor uh, uh, to people inside the U.S. government and in the U.S. Congress, so we're very lucky to have him here today. Uh, to his right. Uh, we have Professor Ken Minkhaus, who has taught political science at Davidson College since 1991, and he's here today to speak about the Shabab movement of East Africa. Um, before he arrived at Davidson College, he taught at the American University in Cairo, and since that time, he's developed a, a, a specialization in the Horn of Africa, where he's focused on development, conflict analysis, peace building, and political Islam, all issues that are still with us today. Uh, in 1993 and 94, Ken put his expertise into practice as an advisor to the UN mission in Somalia, where he played a key role in coordinating a very diffuse international effort uh, that was confronting a very thorny problem. He then distilled those lessons that he'd learned in Somalia as a professor at the U.S. Army Peacekeeping Institute in 1994-95. And since that time, he's been a prolific author of important studies on Somalia and the problem of Islamism in the Horn of Africa, including his uh, very prescient 2004 book, Somalia, State Collapse and the Threat of Terrorism, uh, I, which was written at a time when not many people were uh, 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 appreciated the danger of Islamist militancy in, uh, in Somalia. And just to his right, our final panelist, John Sheehan, I'd say this, if for Al-Qaeda there's such a thing as an Al-Qaeda 2.0, then perhaps John Sheehan is Ken Minkhaus 2.0. Because in addition to having a very similar hair color as Ken, uh, John has followed in his footsteps, having served uh, in the United Nations Mission for Somalia, working in the political office in Nairobi, Kenya last year. 
Uh, he's here from the Kennedy School at Harvard where his research also focuses on the Horn of Africa and he's going to tell us about the security situation in Somalia today. But I wonder what Ken Minkhouse would have answered if he were asked in 1994 about the likelihood that young American scholars would still 17 years later be advising UNISOM on how to do state building while dealing with the problem of Somali Islamist militias. Um, perhaps Ken can wrap his answer into, into his remarks that he's going to give us. But I think this is a perfect argument for why we're spending, we're investing so much of our energies on these problems. Uh, because when we don't, then the questions and the, and the problems tend to endure until they fall into our children's laps. So in order to avoid that outcome, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Phil Yu to uh, uh, handle the first, uh, the first topic. Thank you, Professor. Yes, with, uh, of course, uh, a very intimate thought for all our children and their laps. Um, so um, I will uh, try uh, today to assess uh, the situation and the perspective of Al-Qaeda in uh, North Africa and the Sahel, namely Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM, which, uh, as you all know, uh, was a new uh, name of uh, the Salafist group for preaching and combat, GSPC, from its French acronym, that merged into Al-Qaeda in January 2007. It is, in fact, uh, quite um, uh, an extraordinary merging because this is the only instance when Al-Qaeda accepted an organization per se, without changing it, without, you know, having... Uh, little more than political commissars, you know, uh, monitoring the conformity or this or that Sharia. In fact, th they took it as a package. Why? Because basically for them it was a peripheral uh, um, theater. They didn't care a lot. There, were there was no love lost between Algerian jihadis and Al-Qaeda for many reasons. But they needed uh, this uh, new offshoot uh, for two main reasons. One that is embedded in the title of the organization, Islamic Maghreb, which is that they hope the Algerian jihadis to uh, achieve regional integration with uh, their fellow uh, jihadis from neighboring countries, especially Morocco and Tunisia. And second, because they hoped that in the 2000s, uh, the Algerian jihadis could be as aggressive on the, on the northern tier, against the northern tier, namely Spain, uh, uh, Italy and mostly France than they had been uh, during uh, the 90s. On both accounts, uh, it failed because the Algerian jihadi group remained basically Algerian and as we will see, expanding basically through Mauritania, then through the Sahel, but without being able to uh, um, absorb the other North African uh, um, affiliates and because they were not able to strike uh, uh, Europe, uh, first because of uh, very efficient cooperation uh, between the security services on both sides of the Mediterranean. And second, because of the ongoing uh, crisis of the jihadi discourse, its uh, incapacity to recruit uh, uh, recently for many reasons, especially because of the illegitimacy of the religious uh, message that is uh, uh, connected with this discourse, and also because of the crisis of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, uh, Iraq was the main um, appealing argument for those groups to recruit, and the moment Al-Qaeda in Iraq ran down after Zarqawi's death, it was uh, off, more or less, for uh, European recruitment, or recruitment in Europe. Um, uh, so Sahara emerged as a fallback option. It was not the produce of uh, strategic thinking, uh, with a s significant amount of transfer of power, operational power, to the two main commanders in the Sahara, Mortar Bel Mortar, the historical one, uh, who focused very much on uh, uh, Mauritania, and the newcomer, but who has been uh, coming up fast in the hierarchy of the global jihad, Abdel Hamid Abu Zaid, so one has his own katiba, uh, which is in fact a, a company, uh, uh, not a brigade, uh, 100 plus uh, jihadis, uh, the Mullah Samoun, and the other one, has the other katiba, the Tarek M. Giyad, uh, under his command. But uh, Abu Zaid developed a very strong relationship and direct relationship with uh, Al-Qaeda Central, not a physical one, but through uh, proxies. 
and uh, to make a long story short this uh, ended up in may uh, 2009 with the first instance of execution of a, a western hostage uh, uh, it was a british tourist who was killed after um, documented contact between Waziristan and Abu Zaid, while before the Western hostages were uh, released uh, against ransoms, FT ransoms, or against the securing of the release of jihadi uh, prisoners. So um, uh, this was a significant uh, turning point uh, with an escalation in the hostage taking in the fall of 2009 and really a competition between uh, the Belmortar group and uh, uh, Abdel Hamid Abu Zaid, each one operating through his uh, criminal uh, uh, partners. Uh, uh, they very rarely were Al-Qaeda uh, directly involved in the abduction. They were delivered to Al-Qaeda after two or three days and then of course starting the negotiation and uh, the crisis. So what we have now is that, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, to, to make a complex story very short, uh, Belmortar hasn't any hostage left. He tried to get some even recently in the uh, Niger capital of Niamey, uh, beginning of this year. Two poor young French who were abducted and who were killed during an attempt to rescue them on the border between Mali and Niger. But um, Abu Zaid has uh, five hostages, four French, uh, were abducted uh, on September 15 on uh, the site of uh, the nuclear-connected uh, uh, um, uh, society Areva in northern Niger in Arlit. And uh, we had uh, messages that were broadcast uh, by them this uh, very morning, very dramatic messages broadcast uh, courtesy of AQIM, requesting what is now the standard uh, claim by AQIM, the withdrawal of the French troop from Afghanistan, which is a way for Abu Zaid to uh, uh, totally uh, get in harmony with the global agenda and, of course, to uh, um, reap uh, uh, some benefits and additional support by uh, Ben Laden, Zawahiri, and the other. My analysis is that uh, Abu Zaid uh, hopes to become one of these days the Emir of Al Qaeda for the Sahara, uh, for the whole Sahel region, uh, with a new name. You know, they are very, they have a very fertile imagination, inventing, you know, like Islamic Maghreb. What is Islamic Maghreb? I still don't know. Anyway, uh, so uh, they will find a way, and like that, Abu Zaid will, you know, get more autonomous from the. Uh, um, uh, the leadership of AQIM, which is still besieged uh, in uh, or entrenched in uh, uh, the little Waziristan that you have east of Algiers, uh, which is, you know, sadly called the triangle of death uh, in the three governorates of uh, Boumerdes, uh, Bouira, and uh, Tizi Ouzou. Mm? So there is a total disconnect now between the two, uh, the Saharan branch on one side and the Kabylian branch on the other side, mainly because Abu Zaid, by you know, ad, uh, endorsing fully the global jihadi uh, agenda, is deconnecting from his Algerian route and is also trying to um, uh, uh, gain more power over uh, his fellow jihadi main competitor, Mortar Belmortar, with more from the old guard, mo more traditional one. Uh, you know, both of them are, are gangster jihadis, but you know, Belmortar does 80% uh, smuggling, 20% jihadi, while you know, uh, Abu Zaid just uh, inverted the proportion of the cocktail, if I may speak about cocktails, with uh, jihadi uh, or operatives. And uh, Abdel Amin Abu Zaid had recently abducted uh, an Italian tourist in the uh, beginning of February in southern uh, Algeria. So this group was totally taken aback by the Arab uprising. You know, their first statement uh, about Tunisia was issued the day before the fall of Ben Ali when they were you know, uh, emphatically uh, proposing their support to uh, the, uh, um, uh, the protesters and it fell on death. Nobody even take care about it. 
about Libya, it took them one week to make their first statement about the insurgency, and it was much more comment than anything else. And when finally the leader of, of AQIM uh, made a statement to the descendants Ahfad or Omar al Muhtar, you know, the descendant of Omar al Muhtar, who is a symbolic leader of the insurgency, uh, it was uh, um, a totally uh, a mismatch because the whole statement was against NATO. Uh, the very day NATO had decided to bomb Gaddafi, so they really appeared as being supporting Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was very uh, terrible for their for their uh, um, uh, operation in 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 the region. So far, and I will come again to Libya because you know I receive a lot of questions, feedbacks, you know, about the jihadis in Libya. You know, I saw that the moment Gaddafi says something, usually one tends to believe the contrary. But no, you know, from time to time, you know, <laughs> there is some overlap. Huh? So uh, if you're talking about really the main area of operation of a QIM in the Sahel, uh, in Mauritania, they have been uh, nearly uh, destroyed and expelled from the country because of a very efficient anti-jihadi jihad, because it is a jihad that is officially waged by the Islamic Republic of Mauritania against IQIM, and they were very strong, and they have been practically expelled, so now, you know, uh, every three, four months, we have a kamikaze exploding in the peripheral area, because they cannot get to Nouakchott, you know, and because it's very bumpy roads, so I don't know if you, if no, 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 I'm, not, I'm serious, this is exactly what happens. They, they, they explode with their, with, their, with, their, uh, um, with their bombs. In Niger, they couldn't uh, jeopardize the democratic elections that just took place with the opponent, uh, Isufu, becoming the new president. And in Mali, you have uh, quite a, a democratic system going on despite of all the troubles occurring, uh, occurring in northern Mali, which is also why the Malian army doesn't want to go north because uh, uh, first the president, uh, ATT, that is known under his acronym, uh, uh, Toumani, uh, Amadou Toumani Touré, is known under this acronym. He doesn't want to be the, 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 the leader sending back the army to the north. He, uh, he's a very painful memories of uh, fighting the insurgents in the north. But also because um, um, uh, there is some kind of, of, of balance between the different tribes and AQIM and all this that is not basically threatening uh, what you could say is uh, the le Mali utile. You know. um, so Libya, Libya, huh? uh, jihadis and Libya. Well, nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry to say nothing. <laughs> no, 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 not even a little bit of fire behind all this smoke. Why? Because uh, the, Libani, uh, pff, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, LIFG, was certainly very strong 12 to 15 years ago in Cyrenaica in general and in Derna in particular. But they were, you know, destroyed by Gaddafi at that time, which is why they immigrated to uh, Afghanistan and why they started to cooperate with Al-Qaeda. And the one who are still over there, well, they merged officially into Al-Qaeda in 2007. And they are not the ones who are there on the ground. The ones who are on the ground are basically, uh, uh, if they are former jihadists, but they are anti qaddafi guerrillas, they are a segment of it, the famous or infamous Derna Brigade. And so you had all these talks about the Sinjar document and how many jihadis in Iraq were coming from Derna and so on and so forth. So it's not the Sinjar document, you know, this is a, this is a computerized uh, a data bank of the Jihadi International. Well, uh, the reality is that everybody who's seen the Derna Brigade, you know, uh, recently, and they've been probably the most visited brigade in all uh, the Libyan insurgency because of all these talks about Jihadis, what they saw, a lot of bearded men, ah, what, what a discovery, yes. <laughs> Very conservative when it comes to Islam, ah, what a discovery. We're talking about Syrianica, we're not talking about uh, downtown uh, Marrakech. Huh? And, and, um, and, but what is surprising is that a lot of former anti-American militants who now say, okay, okay, we don't love America, but NATO is great, you know, <laughs> and, and, and they say it on the record, you know, <laughs> which is exactly the contrary of what Al-Qaeda propaganda is saying day and night, 
Uh, nothing good can come from it. Nothing. And they are among the one, you know, and I won't quote Hassadi, I won't come back to uh, Abu Sufyan in Kumu, who was in Guantanamo and who apparently is not fighting himself, but his two sons are uh, fighting with the Donna Brigade. So what you see is people who are basically anti Gaddafi. Mm? And this is something that you can see in Libya, but you can see in general with the Arab uprising, if I may just uh, may make, it is, it it's a post-colonial fight inside the post-colonial borders. Nobody talks about internationalism. They are not bringing in Egyptian militants, Tunisian revolutionaries, or I don't know what, who, by the way, don't want to come. Huh? Libyans are fighting for Libya, and so on and so forth. So that's another uh, big uh, um, defeat for, uh, for Al-Qaeda. Then Algeria, of course, you know, huh? the Algerians, anonymously, of course, were the first one to explain that Al-Qaeda uh, came to uh, Libya like a big uh, market, and they came out of uh, uh, Libya with RPG-7, Strela missiles, that you can call SAM-7, you know, they, they are very, you know, they, they want to provide uh, information. And Idris Deby from Chad, you know, echoed all this. And, of course, Abu Zaid. Abu Zaid is at art and by trade a smuggler and he started as a smuggler with Libya but he was smuggling tea never alcohol huh? <laughs> that's the narrative huh? imagine try to smuggle it on both sides of the border huh? try to live on tea hmm? anyway uh, so th that way you know he, he, he's been trained huh? So, of course, I'm sure that he has people around trying to buy the weapon. But the idea is that uh, this whole idea, like it's Iraq 2003 and suddenly everybody's coming and taking everything from the barracks. I don't know. Maybe you have information that I don't have. But um, maybe uh, there's not all that fire behind all that smoke. Anyway, their priorities haven't changed. They're trying to take, they are opportunistic networks. So of course they will try to take uh, advantage of what is happening in Libya, but they have no stake in Libya right now. Uh, and even when you read, uh, how you say, the, 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 the most influenced Algerian press, they say, oh, jihadis are involved both with Gaddafi and with insurgency. Well, congratulations, you know, that they are the only force who can do that. Um, and there was a few days ago quite a strange, uh, uh, even by jihadi standards, a strange uh, scandal, you know, they, they, they made an official denial of an interview published in El Hayat by an Algerian-based journalist who is very well versed in the jihadi movements, Camille Tawil, who wrote the best book about the uh, jihadi armed uh, groups during the 90s, and who had interviewed an uh, AQIM guerrilla saying, yeah, yes, we are in Libya, and so on, and we do this, and we do And they say, it's totally false. We have nothing to do with Libya. We don't do this, we don't do that. And this is, again, uh, like uh, what Christine Alamb uh, said about uh, Beitoula Mersoud. Those people are not known for uh, over-denying. You know? Usually, they are over-claiming. You know? So if they say they have nothing to do with it, it's probably that they, they, they don't feel at all at ease with what is happening in Libya. So. The Algerians had a kamikaze coming from Libya. I mean, after years of, you know, uh, having uh, the, the jihadis moving from Algeria beyond. So, well, it's not even sure on which side of the border he was, you know, but he was apparently on the Algerian side, in Deb Deb, in front of Gadames. And he was shot with his explosive a few days ago. You have Libyan in Algeria, but they have been there for a while. They are in the Ores, there are a dozen of them. Uh, pretty crazy, even by jihadi standards. So the Algerians don't want to cooperate with them, but they say, oh, yes, they are part of AQIM because this is a region that they don't have access to. But they were there before. And from what I understand, there is not one more since the beginning of the trouble. On the contrary, in the infamous triangle of death, you had, during the past days, a series of very murderous attacks by AQIM. 14 military killed on April uh, 15, one gendarme on April 17, six military on April 18. So it brings me back to the idea that after all, it's still local, you know, and it, uh, despite all the global rhetoric, they're all behaving according to local rationale. So just to, 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 to wrap it up, 
I still believe that despite all the grand uh, talks and uh, the IQIM is on a surviving track. They are trying to buy time, you know, because uh, 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 the future is not theirs, you know, and the odds are against them uh, in uh, the various theaters where they operate. Their main target is in the true jihadi fashion, the far enemy, which happens to be France in this part of the world, which is why they will push for a long-term confrontation with France using to the maximum the hostages, which is also why I truly believe that the hostages are not threatened in the near future because they need them, basically, to, 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 to substantiate this uh, um, uh, media-supported confrontation with France. Um, one year ago, when I came in this uh, dear city about AQIM, or two years ago, the whole talk was about Nigeria and uh, Boko Haram. Well, obviously, nobody thinks about it now. You know, at that time, I was saying there is no connection between AQIM and, and them. The same way, I'm quite uh, uh, positive saying there is no connection with insurgency in Libya. Just one uh, more uh, um, uh, element. Uh, for AQIM, it's obvious we read much more than statements than anybody over there. Basically, nobody cares about what they can say in Tunisia or in Libya today, believe me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Filio. Chris Bosek. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to, to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, New America and, and Peter for the opportunity to, to be back to talk about Yemen and, and uh, Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. I think it's it's good to start off um, just by saying a few things about about Yemen. To try to put terrorism in Yemen and, and AQAP in the right perspective. Uh, I think as everyone you know well knows now, Yemen is facing this awful confluence of crises, and more than anything else, you know, things are not going well in Yemen. And I hate to say that um, everything that could be going wrong is going wrong, but nothing is really trending the right way. Uh, at the heart of all this, you have a failing economy, and this is really the biggest problem. Terrorism is not Yemen's biggest problem. You have the fact that if Yemen's not a failed economy, it very soon will be a failed economy. Over 80% of state income comes from the sale of hydrocarbons, and very quickly the, the country will run out of, uh, um, of oil to export. It's also the poorest country in the Arab world. Um, most people get by on $2 a day, much more really like $1 a day. Um, coupled with rampant corruption, unemployment that's officially at 35%, which would put it on par with the Great Depression in this country, probably much closer to 50% uh, unofficially, endemic governance abuses and, and deficiencies, and massive resource depletion, especially water. And I think this is something that we probably don't appreciate as much when we talk about kind of conflict and, and violence in Yemen, which is more people fight and kill each other fighting over water and access to water than anything else in Yemen. 80% of violence is about people fighting over water. Thousands of people every year are killed. Compared with terrorism and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, it's, a, it's a, a, a much more massive problem. And you have a population that's one of the fastest growing in, in the world. Um, to top it all off, the government is dealing with at least three insurgencies, a civil war in the north, a southern secessionist movement, and this resurgent Al-Qaeda organization, as well as this new protest movement, which is the, the greatest challenge to the Yemeni government and President Saleh in his 32 years of, of uh, uh, being in office. But I think, you know, when, when you look at Yemen and, and the, the conditions in Yemen, this really typifies how there is these emerging spaces for, for Al-Qaeda to fill. And it's really in the undergoverned spaces in Yemen where we see um, AQAP uh, um, taking root and, and, and um, um, using that to their benefit. You know, I think the, the strategic importance of Yemen doesn't really need to be explained very much, but the idea of having a failed state right next door to the world's largest oil producer is, is extremely uh, worrisome. Not to mention the fact that over three million barrels of oil go through Yemeni territorial waters every day, where Islamist terrorists and pirates have targeted crude carriers and warships and, and, and other vessels. Um, but just kind of to round out this snapshot of, of Yemen, you have a country with a history of no central government control, a wash in small arms um, with a national narcotic habit, and a history of religious and political conservatism and, and extremism. Yemenis went abroad to fight in Afghanistan against the Soviets in large numbers. 
they were welcomed back to, to Yemen, um, as were many other Arab Afghans. And you know, Yemenis made up, after Saudis, the largest group in, in Afghan training camps before September 11th. Now Yemenis make up the largest group still held at Guantanamo, which is something maybe we can touch on uh, um, in the, the discussion. But kind of moreover, Yemen has a very special place in the, the mythology and kind of popular history of Al-Qaeda, and a special, um, oftentimes there are very special relationships between some of the Al-Qaeda senior leadership and, and Yemen. Getting to the, the assessment of AQAP and, and where they are today, John Brennan, um, stated a few months ago, actually at Carnegie, that AQAP represents the most active node of the Al-Qaeda uh, uh, franchise. NCTC Director Leiter made similar comments a few, a few weeks ago, um, calling AQAP the most significant threat to the U.S. homeland. And just this afternoon, um, Dan Benjamin made, made similar uh, um, assessments. And I would not dispute that. I think when you look at the course of how this, this organization has emerged, and um, when you think that the Christmas Day attack was the first time that Al-Qaeda had successfully hit a domestic American target, and since September 11th, the plot didn't come out of South Asia, is very worrisome. The fact that that plot was followed up 10 and a half, 11 months later by the package plot is equally worrisome. I think this shows, um, it highlights some of the, 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 the traits that we've come to identify with AQAP. An increasingly lethal organization, a very opportunistic organization that learns very quickly from its, its mistakes. Um, it has a very, very fast learning curve. You know, I couple this with the, the growth potential for Al-Qaeda in, in Yemen, their use of media, um, you know, especially Inspire magazine and, and the, the, the internet and other sources. Um, this is a, a, a very uh, uh, bleak outlook, I would say. AQAP has gone after the same targets over and over again. And um, Equally worrisome is when they don't succeed, they try again. So you can look against the attacks against Prince Mohammed bin Naif, the Saudi counterterrorism chief, who survived about four assassination attempts from Al-Qaeda based in Yemen, two attacks against the U.S. Embassy, multiple attacks or attempted attacks against American aviation targets, as well as U.K. diplomatic targets inside the country. And I think one of the, the, the real worrisome things for me is that when you look and you see how Al-Qaeda, AQAP has transformed Yemen from a place where you could go rest or train for jihad or, or recuperate between jihadi campaigns to be a place where it's, it's permissible to engage in jihad. If you want to resist American aggression or if you want to participate um, in a legitimate jihad, Yemen's the place to, to, to come. To now be a place of inspiration for others. So I think when you see what the messaging is coming over time, it shifted from you don't need to come to Yemen, you can stay at home and you can do just as much damage. I know people have talked an awful lot about Inspire, and, and I think there's been a lot of snickering about making a bomb in your mom's kitchen and things like that. Uh, but some of the things that are the most um, worrisome to me is how this, this publication makes it easier for you to participate, makes it easier um, for you to, to justify your participation in, in violence. And I think when you line up AQAP against the... the Al-Qaeda core or, or um, the senior leadership hiding out in Pakistan, you see that in Yemen, AQAP is not under pressure, right? There is pressure if it's drone strikes or you know, the large American military presence right next door that has Al-Qaeda in, in, in Pakistan under pressure. And instead, in Yemen, we see the undergoverned spaces and the pressure, undergoverned spaces getting bigger and the pressure actually receding. Um, and this is in large part because Al-Qaeda and terrorism is not a priority for the Yemeni government. It has at times been a priority, but it most certainly now is not a priority. And since the protest movement emerged about three months ago or so, we've seen the Yemeni government reposition security assets away from the, the fight against Al-Qaeda and terrorism to protect regime targets, regime um, uh, facilities. We've seen increased defections and desertions in the military. And we've seen these, these spaces getting bigger for, for Al-Qaeda and, and uh, 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 other organizations. Um, moreover, you know, we, we talk about Yemen and AQAP as being a, a, a major priority, but we don't resource it the way we should compared to how we deal with Pakistan and, and other issues, which I think in part leads us to, to, to see how this organization has uh, been able to thrive. I'd say I think that you know, AQAP looks like a small organization, and I think this is in part, um, or a small threat, 
I think this can be in part be explained by the fact that there are a very limited number of targets in Yemen. There's not a large American community or European community. There aren't big American or European investments or schools or anything else like that. And I think when you, when you looked at this organization as opposed to the, the insurgency that took place in Saudi Arabia in 2003 to 2006 or so, Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia never struck outside the kingdom, whereas that's very different in this case. Moreover, um, as far as we know, there were never any public um, uh, or admitted attempts against members of the royal family in Saudi Arabia, and that's very different this time, where at least um, three or four plots and, and attempts against Prince Mohammed. Um, I think a, a few kind of uh, final remarks. I think you know th there's an awful lot that we don't know about AQAP, right? I mean, Yemen is an increasingly difficult place to go to. Most Americans or, or uh, Western researchers, there are a lot of places they don't go in Yemen anymore. Um, but I think you know we can we can in part identify maybe three different trends within AQAP. Um, the first I'd say are the the Yemenis who are focused on a local Yemeni agenda, who are um, you know some of the guys that are occupy the senior leadership positions that are focused on domestic Yemeni issues. I think the second group um, you could identify as the Saudis who are hiding out in Yemen. The, as much as Saudi Arabia has defeated its terrorism problem, a lot of its terrorism problem moved to Yemen. So there are a lot of Saudis who are hiding out that um, probably could care less about what happens in Yemen but are keen to go back to, to the kingdom and fix what they got wrong the last time. And the third group I'd, I'd um, identify as the, the global international Islamists, the, the, the global jihadists, that are composed of um, foreigners, Westerners, Americans included, as well as Yemenis and Saudis, but people who are focused on a larger agenda. And while these aren't probably hard and fast distinctions, there's probably movement back and forth between these different groups, I think it can help us maybe understand how this, uh, uh, how this movement has, has emerged. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, as you know, conditions worsen in Yemen, and President Saleh's government probably will not last um, much longer. Um, one thing that we need to be kind of focused on is that the next regime, the next government, whoever it is that takes power, will not have counterterrorism as a top priority. And I think we need to be kind of very frank and honest about this right now. As much as uh, um, people may dislike the current Yemeni government, they have been cooperative in fighting terrorism. Um, they haven't done everything we want. You know, it's often said that you need two things to fight terrorism, the capacity to do so and the political will. Oftentimes the Yemenis come up short, but the next government will have a whole other set of issues, primarily the economy. The economy is what will destroy Yemen. It's not, it's not Al-Qaeda. And um, looking forward, I think that we can see as, as the state's authority continues to recede, um, whether it's the Saleh government or, or a successor government, these undergoverned spaces are going to get bigger. And this is something that we need to be focused on. And the, the kind of truly depressing part in all of this is that this isn't a problem just in Yemen. It's a problem we're seeing all over. If it's you know, in the Sahel or Tajikistan or, or wherever, it's where central government authority is, is receding and what takes root um, uh, in those weakened states. I think the, the last point I'll, I'll make is that I think there's also the potential for not just AQAP, but I think Islamists and lots of people in general, to look at President Saleh's departure as a victory. This is a regime they've wanted to get rid of for a long time, and, and I think oftentimes Al-Qaeda casts things in their, their uh, um, to fit the, the, their storyline. I think they will see, potentially see President Saleh's departure as a, as a victory. And one of the, the last points that I'll make before handing over is that I think the, the inevitable disillusionment that will come after the revolution, after President Saleh is gone, and what this will do for recruitment and radicalization in Yemen. And this is something I think we need to be thinking about now before, before we get there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Ken Menkhaus. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to reiterate what Chris was just saying about, about our, our, the, the modest amount of knowledge that we can claim to have in some of these now very inaccessible places. And, and uh, I think John and I will both uh, reaffirm that on Somali. It's a very difficult place to get good uh, quality information on, on Shabab. Um, I think we've also been uh, afflicted with a problem of residual thinking on Somalia over the years, and that is to say we're 
uh, pretty confident about our analysis. The problem is that the situation has moved on and we're about two years out of date. Um, when I wrote that book, State Collapse and the Threat of Terrorism in 2004, um, you will find not one time I mentioned the word Shabab. Um, even though they were operational at that point, it took a full year or so before we kind of realized that this group was um, was up to, to no good. Um, and then finally, in response to your, your challenge about the, the generational project of state building and, and getting it right in Somalia, I think uh, one of the things that the Somali state has done is, is it has uh, underscored the fact that you can't predict what you can't imagine. Um, the idea that this is a country that is now in its 20th year of complete state collapse um, was way beyond anyone's comprehension uh, back in 1991. Um, no one uh, could have foreseen this happening. What I'd like to do is start w with a, a few uh, pieces of historical background on Shabab, just to put this organization in context. I think that'll help tee up John's talk as well. Uh, in the event that you haven't been following um, the organization on a month-by-month -month, uh, case, and um, to, to begin with, to go back to our theme about 2001, 10 years later, um, there was no Shabab in 2001. Uh, in fact, when we look back in 2001, there was no. Uh, organized Islamist movement of any kind in Somalia at that point in time. There had been al Ittihad al-Islamiyah, an armed Islamic group from 91 to 96. It was defeated in Luke uh, by the Ethiopian military. It essentially disbanded and became a group of alumni. Um, it was a low point. Its ex-leader, Hassan Dehir Awais, had fled to Syria, and we thought uh, we shouldn't have because all Somali political leaders apparently have nine lives, uh, that he was done. Uh, there was absolutely no reason uh, to predict in 2001 that Somalia, 10 years later, we, would be the subject of a discussion about al-Qaeda um, affiliates. I, this is, again, just by way of historical background, a reminder that Somalia uh, was not only, uh, not only has been a collapsed state for 20 years, a complete collapsed state. There is a transitional federal government uh, that was formed in 2004. It is in its final few months of its uh, extended transitional existence, and John will talk more about uh, what comes next in August in a few minutes. Uh, but it's never been able to govern um, beyond some neighborhoods in Mogadishu. Somalia remains one of the poorest states uh, in the world. It uh, remains a zone, at least in southern Somalia, of high insecurity, uh, of enormous displacement. This is one of the world's worst humanitarian crises, and that crisis is heating up in a big way because there's a serious drought there. So we could be talking about famine, and I'd like to come back to that at the end of my uh, talk. Shabab uh, has essentially gone through three phases. Uh, the first phase of its existence started in 2003 to th through 2006, and this was a phase where it was a relatively small, low-level group, uh, and it was controlled by political masters, uh, uh, essentially Hassan de Hirawais. Uh, this was initially just one of 16 local clan-based Sharia courts. Uh, Sharia courts had popped up in the, the, the capital Mogadishu to provide some local law and order. They were popular. They were not radical. Most of the Sharia police were just kids with guns who were happy to work for a couple bucks a day. This one was different. This one was a group of committed, well-trained uh, uh, Islamists, some of whom were uh, 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 ex-Mujahideen from Afghanistan. Their militia commander, uh, Adin Hashi Iro, was one of them, and that made them very different. Um, their political master, uh, Hassan Dihir Awais, was himself not particularly interested in al-Qaeda and had stiff-armed al-Qaeda uh, through a period in the early 90s where the East Africa al-Qaeda cell was trying to reach out to al-Ittihad in Somalia. Um, Awais was not interested. He's more of an Islamo-nationalist. What we came we came to know Shabab um, first in a series of what, what was called a, a dirty war of assassinations in 2004, 2005, 2006 in Mogadishu, in which they were taking out uh, ex-military uh, officers, intelligence uh, people who were liaising with Ethiopia or the West, uh, as we were trying to monitor the situation in um, in Mogadishu. Uh, they also reached out to the East Africa Al-Qaeda cell, which was responsible for the bombings of our embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Uh, the East Africa Al-Qaeda cell, some high-value targets, about five people apparently, were found coming and going and receiving uh, 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 safe havens in Mogadishu, which attracted our attention. In 2006, everything changes. Uh, this is a dramatic moment for Shabab. 
Uh, I'm going to make a very long story very short. Uh, a group called the Islamic Courts Union got into a battle with a coalition of militia leaders uh, that were backed by us. Uh, the Islamic Courts Union won, thanks almost entirely to the disciplined uh, uh, fighting of Shabab, which numbered only about 400 men, but, but in a context of a, of a city broken into a lot of warlord fiefdoms where most of the kids wouldn't fight after 2 o'clock because they had to chew a particular leaf there. Um, uh, it, wasn't it wasn't very difficult for Shabab to roll um, our friends, um, at which point the, uh, the Islamic Courts Union consolidated control over all of Mogadishu and then very quickly over almost all of southern Somalia. The bad news was hardliners in this loose Islamist umbrella movement gained the ascendance, uh, provoked uh, tensions with Ethiopia, and in December of 06, Ethiopia rolled in, smashed the ICU. The ICU leadership fled to Eritrea, Shabab melted into the interior, and then Ethiopia, with our assistance uh, and support, uh, occupied, well, actually we told them, please, whatever you do, don't occupy Mogadishu, but they did anyway. Um, but we provided some support for Ethiopia. Ethiopian forces stayed for two years. Ethiopia is the arch enemy of Somalia. It was not difficult to predict, in fact, the only thing we all predicted correctly is that there would be an insurgency against this occupation in a matter of weeks. Uh, Shabab took full advantage. Shabab uh, renounced the ICU's political leadership and said from now on we are uh, the political, we, we are the insurgency and people outside the country work on our behalf. Uh, so they became a political as well as a military movement. Um, they uh, gained, they consolidated control over what had been a loose complex insurgency against uh, the Ethiopians. Uh, and most importantly, they were able to conflate anti-Ethiopianism, Somali nationalism, and their interpretation of Islamism, which was much more radical than the ICUs, uh, and much more inclined to promote uh, links with Al-Qaeda, uh, in a single ideology that found a lot of resonance among Somalis. And I should add at this point that Somalis were furious. They had seen six months of orderly rule under the ICU. They thought their long national nightmare was over. The Ethiopian occupation, the insurgency and counterinsurgency was devastating. 700,000 people were displaced from the capital city out of a population of 1.3 million, a lot of damage. They were radically angry, uh, and they were in a mood to support whoever was shooting at the transitional federal government, which had been put back in place, and the Ethiopian forces, and then later the African Union peacekeeping forces that John will talk about, to, who came to eventually replace the Ethiopians. That translated for us into a level of anti-Americanism um, that, 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 that I had never experienced in 25 years of work in the country. We used to be, again, very much as Christina was saying, used to be able to walk the streets and people like now, uh, that was done, uh, furious with U.S. policies there. Um, this was the 2007-2008 was a period of, of, of uh, uh, was, was really the peak, uh, the highlight for Shabab. Uh, it had a lot of local support. It had a lot of support from the Somali diaspora, both financial and in some cases actual recruitment. Um, and it forged good ties with Al-Qaeda. Since 2009, the organization has been in decline. Why? The Ethiopians left. Uh, there was a change of government in the transitional federal government, and an arch enemy uh, was replaced as president by uh, one of their former leaders, a uh, moderate Islamist, which took some winds out of their sail. Um, and mainly, though, it's because they have earned a terrible reputation among the Somalis for the various things that they've done that I'll come back to later. Um, this is, uh, th this is uh, uh, essentially a period now um, where they've been fighting uh, in a stalemate for the past two years or more without making much progress. They control uh, most of southern Somalia from the Kenyan border to most of the neighborhoods of Mogadishu. Of course, that's changing right now, uh, at least temporarily, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but they haven't been able to push the African Union forces out. They haven't been able to push the transitional federal government out. Uh, they've been in a period of, of, of essentially a, a prolonged stalemate, uh, and that's where we are today. Now, my, my assessment of this, of this movement. First, uh, the link with foreign fighters and al-Qaeda. Uh, one of the problems in Somalia is defining foreign. Uh, the Somalis will say the foreign Al-Qaeda person here and there, uh, and after a while you realize that they, what they're talking about are the Somalis who came from the north of Somalia who are foreign for them. Okay, <laughs> so you have to parse that out. Uh, then there are the Somalis from Sweden and Canada and elsewhere, and they're foreigners because they're holding a foreign passport. And then there are the non-Somali 
foreigners as well. And, and, and it's important to get this straight because otherwise the numbers can sound very inflated about, about who really is a, uh, a foreigner there. All three are present. Um, we think about 800 or so, I've seen lots of estimates, uh, ballpark 800 or so foreigners are there of whom about 40 are Somali Americans have, have at least at some point gone over to fight in the name of Shabab. Most of these foreigners are Somali diaspora. There are now 1.5 million Somalis living outside the country. It's about 15% of the total population. Um, and they are, they are playing an important role um, in Shabab. What's interesting is they're also playing a critical role um, in the transitional federal government and the Somaliland government and the Puntland government. Most of the parliament, the prime ministers from Buffalo, uh, the, uh, most of the, the cabinet uh, and, and parliament are, 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 are passport holders. And this has led, uh, one of the most interesting observations I've heard from Somalis in recent years um, is that this is a war of the diaspora. Those of us who don't have passports are caught in the middle. We're the ones who are dying and suffering. Um, they're the ones who are fighting. And they can leave whenever they want. And it's an interesting new twist to, uh, to their interpretation of what's going on there. The key with the diaspora is that not that they have provided Shabab with, uh, with, with a, a, a big range of fighters. Fighting is not the thing they do best. Somalia needs to import a lot of things. But they're flush on teenagers who know how to use an AK-47. They're good for that. But what the foreigners are important for, first and foremost, is as advisors. This was a movement that was all muscle and no brain until it morphed from a militia to a political movement. It needed that help. And some of those foreigners are playing a very important role in providing political guidance. Some argue to the point of even exercising some control over the organization. There's little al-Qaeda direct financial support. Um, for al-Qaeda, most of their involvement here appears to be uh, opportunistic. This was a high, I'm, I'm sorry, a low risk, high yield irritant to the United States and its allies in the region. It causes us lots and lots of grief. Um, they don't have to do much at all. They, they appropriated Shabab's victory over Ethiopia when Ethiopia withdrew at a time when they desperately needed some good news. Um, but they're, in some ways, they're dabbling. Um, one of the things that I think is important also to point out with al-Qaeda in Somalia um, is that they didn't, in fact, find Somalia uh, a zone that was completely permissive. This is not a place where they're attempting to establish a major base of operations. Um, and that flies in the face of some of our conventional wisdom about ungoverned space. Uh, truly ungoverned space is a pretty tough place to operate, whether you're an, a, a, an aid agency or a terrorist cell. Um, it, what what al-Qaeda has found in the Horn of Africa is that actually weak, venal, somewhat corrupt states, uh, i.e. Kenya in the 1990s, um, was a much more conducive environment uh, to operate, uh, establish businesses, and plan and execute terrorist attacks against a plethora of soft targets that Kenya has uh, that Somalia most certainly uh, does not. A word on, on leadership. Uh, at this point, I think in my own assessment, I like to think of the leaders in Shabab as one of three categories. There are the foreigners, um, there are the Somalis who are constituency free in southern Somalia, that is to say mostly from the north of Somalia, um, who can, like the foreigners, make decisions uh, about tactics and objectives that are relatively indifferent to the interests of the local community. And then there are the Shabab leaders who are constituency based in the South. And they need to care about what happens to their own people. Uh, and this matters. This matters a lot when it comes to uh, 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 how many casualties are going to be incurred in an offensive, um, whether food relief is or is not allowed into southern Somalia by Shabab. Um, and this is a major source of tension, I think, between these, these three groups. The constituency-based leaders are, are an opportunity for us because they have to care about the impact of their decisions on local populations. I would say that the first two categories of leadership, the foreigners and the constituency-free Shabab leaders, have made a series of very unpopular decisions that have really harmed Shabab in recent years. Three quickly. Um, first, uh, the decision to suspend or block food aid into southern Somalia, which was done piecemeal there and was a subject of a lot of internal debate within Shabab. Um, this is, uh, is going to be a hot button issue as this impending famine uh, strikes the country. This is a very, very serious drought. And it's a perfect storm, as you know, because food prices are high, fuel prices are high. I mean, this is as bad as it's going to be. Um, and Shabab is going to be held responsible. Why? Because the, those who don't have a clan or a constituency in the South don't necessarily care about the impact there. 
Second, uh, uh, about two years ago, there was a Danish Somali jihadist who uh, engaged in a suicide bombing at a medical school graduation in Mogadishu, uh, killing a bunch of newly minted doctors, as well as the Minister of Education, who was an American Somali. Again, you get the picture, the, the, the war, the diaspora. And this, this was, uh, this caused huge rifts in the movement, with a lot of Somalis saying, is this what you stand for? I mean, we desperately need doctors. Why in the world would you blow them up? And then the third was the Ramadan offensive last year, um, in which they took an enormous number of casualties and were apparently indifferent to the fact that many of the, the young men who were fighting and who died were from uh, some, some clans in, in, in the South um, who were very upset that they had been used as cannon fodder. Um, and, and, and there are stories, actually, about them even being triaged in some very uh, awful ways. Uh, the point is, these, some of these leaders have made decisions that reflected an indifference to Somali interests. And this is critical, because to the extent that Al-Qaeda or its friends in Somalia make these decisions that look like they're interested in the far enemy, in a bigger fight, a bigger prize, and Somalia is really just a platform for their ambitions, they are running afoul of Somali interests. And, and you do not want to be a foreigner in Somalia who is not seen as useful to the Somali people. We, we've learned that many times. In terms of Shabab's goals and ideology, uh, let me wrap up quickly here because we're starting to run short of time. Um, it's certainly split. Some are hopeful to establish an Islamic state, an irredentist state, which makes neighboring states like Kenya and Ethiopia nervous. Others really are seeing Somalia just as a base uh, for global jihad. And then there's a third group that's, that appears to be, m at this point, degenerating into uh, a group that's, that's feeding off of a war economy. And this is important because th there has been a stalemate for two years now. Um, and it doesn't look to some Somalis like Shabab is really trying to win, trying to make that final push to take all of Mogadishu. Some are starting to suspect that Shabab's interests are served by a prolonged stalemate. They get jihad in perpetuity that allows them to mobilize against an enemy. They have a tangible enemy. Most importantly, as long as they're fighting this war, they don't have to govern. One of the things that they seem to be most fearful of is that moment when they have to declare a state or a government, and that's when all the tough decisions are going to be have to be made about who rules, about whether you ignore a clan and transcend it or institutionalize it in the, in, in, the, in, in, in proportional representation. Uh, many Somalis predict that if that moment ever comes, the next war will be an intra-Islamist war um, within that group. Uh, let me let me just. Uh, cut to the chase on a couple of final points. One is is, is the popularity uh, of the movement. It has certainly been in decline since 2008 for some of the reasons I've just articulated. Also, there is a stigma attached to Shabab now since it's been designated as a terrorist group. So for the, the Somali diaspora, uh, it's much more toxic to be anywhere near uh, Shabab. And also, Shabab in the few places that it's tried to actually govern. For the most part, it hasn't. This is not Hezbollah. It's not setting up social services or a state within a state at all. But in a handful of the urban areas where it has tried to exercise some kind of authority, it's been horrific. Um, the kind of interpretation, draconian interpretations of Sharia law have appalled um, Somalis. Um, it has also been very susceptible to claims by Somalis that it is espousing un-Somali un interpretations of Islam, and that's a pretty damning indictment in, in Somalia. There have been whole clans that have made the calculation that they want to distance themselves from Shabab, the Air clan, which initially was a powerful Mogadishu-based uh, clan with a lot of business interests, um, uh, at one point decided to move away as a group, and that was very revealing. There are other clans in Somalia that I won't talk about that are, that, that are currently interested in doing the same thing because the costs have gone up uh, with that affiliation. The future, um, right now, Shabab is strong only because it's the only team on the playing field. The transitional federal government has been unable to hold any, uh, any territory. Uh, some suspect that it's unwilling uh, to, to do this. Um, one of the questions that, uh, one of the best questions that I, that I find to, to ask in the Somali context is, time is on whose side? Uh, is time on Shabab's side? Can they play for a draw and eventually wear out the Amazon forces and, and the rest of us? Or, in fact, is time on our side? Uh, the longer that Shabab stays in place, the less credible they are to Somalis, the more likely that Somali centrifugal forces, whether it's Klan or subnational governments, um, are going to erode uh, their, their power. 
Uh, I would also say that they are more dangerous when they're weak, and their weakness now worries me. I think it's in their interest to try to regionalize or globalize the conflict. They do have the capacity at any point to reach out into Kenya uh, to get up to mischief. They've got a fairly extensive network there, but they haven't. And this is an interesting, to go back to the point that Barry Lynn uh, was making about the integrated global economy and some of the some of the threats that that poses uh, to us, it also creates a constraint for Shabab. And that is because the Somali economy today is thoroughly globalized. It runs almost entirely off of remittances from the 1.5 million Somalis abroad. They are sending back, we think, close to $2 billion a year. Nothing else, even piracy ransom, you know, that's up to about 150 million now, uh, nothing else comes close to matching that. And that constrains Shabab from launching terrorist attacks in Kenya or elsewhere because they know what will happen. There will be a law enforcement crackdown on powerful Somali interests in these places, and that will compromise the flow of remittances, at which point they won't have to worry about what we do to them. They're going to have to worry about what the Somali people do to them. Um, and I think that's one of our great advantages in, in trying to outflank this group. Thank you. John Sheehan. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so now uh, you know why I'm glad to follow Ken, because he just took uh, some of the most complex, par complex parts of Somali history and condensed it to about 20 minutes. There's no way I could have done that. I get the easy job. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the security situation here. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do to uh, illustrate that is uh, I'm going to open up with a statistic. Um, one of the themes that we've hit upon here is a, a decentralization of the Al-Qaeda movement uh, into all these different uh, corners of the globe. Um, However, it, we can all agree that our primary focus within the U.S. is in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, in FY12, the U.S. has allocated uh, $117 billion um, for the, uh, the security uh, effort um, in Afghanistan. Now, comparing that to Somalia, there was a talk in October 2010 where uh, Assistant Secretary of State of African Affairs, Johnny Carson, said that dating back to 2007, um, the United States has contributed $265 million uh, to the official security apparatus in Somalia. So in Afghanistan, we're spending $300 million a day, whereas in Somalia, we haven't spent $270 million in the last four years. Now, take that with a grain of salt. There are many caveats that need to come with that. Uh, the first is that, obviously, we have 100,000 troops deployed in Afghanistan, and it requires that level of resources in order to support them. Um, second, I, I don't offer this um, in, in order to advocate that we need to be more robustly or directly engaged in Somalia. I just offer it as a point or food for thought for those of, that believe in the, uh, the follow the money approach. Um, so speaking to the U.S. objectives in Somalia, um, or U.S. interests in Somalia, one of which uh, we've talked about earlier um, is the radicalized youth uh, coming out of the United States. Um, that poses uh, a problem. We've talked about the, uh, the Oregon, uh, the failed um, attempt in Oregon and the entrapment issue and, and the issue of uh, counter-radicalization, which uh, Dr. Newman hit upon. Um, the second issue is uh, the prospect of an absolute al-Shabaab victory in Somalia and all the things that come with it. Uh, terrorist safe haven, trans transshipment point, uh, a, a base of attacks. A and speaking to that uh, latter issue, um, Obviously, we need a military component, and that military component and the response in country is the African Union mission in Somalia, or AMISOM. Um, but we all can all acknowledge that it, we can't win this uh, strictly through military means. There also need to be political solutions within Somalia in order to address some of these threats uh, in country. Uh, for one, the TFG needs to reform. Uh, for another, we need to focus on reconciliation uh, efforts. Uh, three. And uh, Ambassador Benjamin mentioned the, uh, the dual track uh, initiative through the State Department. These are all things that we can do to work on the political end of things. But the problem is that progress on the political front is stunted uh, by the fact that al-Shabaab is incredibly strong in southern Somalia. So as a result, the security issue uh, today is, is, is the most acute problem that we face. It isn't that these other elements are any less uh, critical. It's just that without progress on the security front, it's tremendously difficult to make progress uh, on the other lines. So uh, fast forwarding ahead to my bottom line. Uh, we've seen tremendous progress uh, over the course of the past uh, seven to eight months, uh, particularly with respect to Amisom's performance. Um, but it must be noted that uh, problems do persist. 
Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with the progress. I'm going to focus on uh, three things here. The first, AMISOM is at greater strength now uh, than it has been, and, and there's now a more robust interpretation uh, of its mandate. Uh, and, and in my estimation, I think Kampala, the, the attacks, uh, the 7-Eleven World Cup attacks, uh, was the turning point. Uh, at that point, we had, uh, or AMISOM had 6,000 troops um, within Somalia, um, both um, Ugandan, or the majority of which were Ugandan, uh, but also from uh, Burundi. Today, there are 9,000 uh, AMISOM troops, uh, so they've increased by 50%, uh, and there are another 3,000 more that will likely follow uh, in the coming months because their mandate uh, through the UN Security Council authorizes them to go up to 12,000. Um, also, uh, I, I referenced uh, the interpretation of the mandate. There is now uh, an interpretation that I, I guess could be best described as, as preemptive uh, self-defense. So it, it's allowed, uh, it's allowed uh, AMISOM to be a, a little bit more engaged in Somalia than they have been in, in the past. Uh, the second uh, point of progress is, uh, and Ken referenced this, is that um, AMISOM was able to successfully fend off uh, the Ramadan offensive in August. Um, and y it could be argued that the Ramadan offensive from the standpoint of al-Shabaab was ill-advised. Um, but regardless, this was still a tremendous victory uh, for AMISOM and, and good for momentum. Uh, it's reported that Am uh, al-Shabaab lost a reported uh, 800 fighters, uh, and it also sparked a, a rift within the leadership of al-Shabaab, and, and Ken briefly touched upon this, and we can go further in depth uh, in your questions if you'd like. The third point is that um, al uh, AMISOM has regained uh, an, um, a significant amount of territory from al-Shabaab in the aftermath of the Ramadan offensive. And this could be the, the long-awaited uh, offensive that the TFG uh, has been talking about um, now for years. Uh, it, it's estimated that uh, cont TFG control has gone from about a few blocks to approximately 50% uh, of Mogadishu. Though I'll also note that al-Shabaab's uh, supply channels have been disrupted within this fight, and, and, and key tunnels um, that have been able to bring uh, resources and fighters into government-controlled territory have also been captured. So th these are uh, tremendous developments uh, for Amazon. Yet at the same time, despite this progress, uh, there are significant issues that remain outstanding. Uh, the first is uh, that the TFG's mandate is uh, scheduled to expire in August 2011. This is a critical point because AMISOM's mandate authorizes them to protect the transitional federal authorities. Now, if there are no transitional federal authorities, what does this mean for the sake of AMISOM? What are they going to do? Uh, could they protect the ports? Would they move to a humanitarian mission? Uh, th these are all options, theoretically, uh, but at the same time, if you follow the debate back to July, um, AMISOM wanted a more robust interpretation of the mandate. Um, so this, this calls the whole thing into question. This issue is going to have to be addressed. Uh, the second point, uh, TFG forces cannot stand on their own. Uh, they still need AMISOM to hold up the, uh, the government. At first, there was an issue with pay. Uh, and, and then uh, the West and the donor nation stepped in uh, a PricewaterhouseCoopers contract. And that helped uh, this uh, somewhat. But there are, are still issues uh, that remained. Uh, and there are also issues with command control, uh, discipline, uh, and corruption. Uh, you really just need to open up the paper, do a quick Google search, and you can all usually find something about TFG forces going to war with one another. Um, and if, if this is the case, then uh, how, are we, how do you get them on the same page? This is, this is another problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, the third point, hold of territory. Um, this is kind of amorphous and, and difficult to define, and it's somewhat complicated by the fact that Amazon uh, has a somewhat uh, de defensive uh, mandate. This is applicable to both sides. Um, and Somalia's clans that Ken talked about are, are, are the, the primary entity here. Um, for the sake of the TFG, they need the assistance of clan militias uh, to hold territory, but they also need the clan militias to kind of gain a, a, an a offensive capability by proxy, given this defensive mandate uh, that we talked about. Um, for the sake of al-Shabaab, uh, despite the fact that al-Shabaab controls about 90 to 95 percent of uh, southern Somalia, uh, the best way to describe this is that some of southern Somalia's clans find it more expedient to acquiesce to al-Shabaab than to go up against them uh, and fight them. So it's imperative that al-Shabaab's leaders keep these, uh, al-Shabaab keeps these clan leaders at, on their side. Um, so anyway, the, the point of hold of, of territory, when you're reading, well, how much do we control of Mogadishu? Take all that with a grain of salt when you're reading about Somalia and, and think about those things. Uh, the fourth point, um, demonstration effect. Uh, it's still not apparent. 
Um, to use the, the, I guess, an AFPAC analogy, um, Amisom can degrade al-Shabaab, but only cooperation with Somalia's clans can de decisively s defeat uh, al-Shabaab. Somalia's clans need to see that uh, TFG-aligned forces can win and that it's in their interest that the TFG-aligned forces win. Uh, until that happens, uh, al-Shabaab is going to remain uh, strong in southern Somalia. Uh, so moving forward, uh, questions going forward. Uh, one, uh, the, the future of the Amisom uh, mandate, and this is an issue that emerged following Kampala. Uh, do we stick with the preemptive self-defense, the, the status quo, or do we opt for a more uh, peace enforcement kind of mandate, which is what Uganda wanted in the aftermath of the Kampala bombings? But we have to bear in mind that this would take different equipment, or it would require different equipment. It would re require increased funding levels uh, from the donor nations, uh, and, and also, in, in my estimation, I think that there's a fear of a, a, a blank check um, to Uganda's forces if, God forbid, there were another ta attack uh, in, in Uganda or Burundi. Um, this could create uh, tremendous levels of chaos. So again, another thing that we need to think about. Um, second point, um, do we focus on southern Somalia as a whole, or do we focus on Mogadishu? Um, the thing that people don't talk about in, in southern Somalia is that there are a lot of neutral clan militias here. It, it's not about everybody's uh, picked a side. Um, I think it was the, uh, the International Crisis Group um, estimated that there are 50,000 some neutral clan militia fighters uh, in southern Somalia. And when you compare that to al-Shabaab's ranks and you see that they have about an estimated 5,000 fighters, you begin to see the extent of this collective action problem. Uh, in southern Somalia. So that, that's a question that needs to be focused on. Perhaps it's better to focus on Mogadishu, uh, to try to focus on uh, the Bakara and cut down another revenue stream for al-Shabaab. Um, also, maybe doing this would leave al-Shabaab to fester uh, in southern Somalia in the midst of this drought. And Ken talked about this. This is an, an acute humanitarian crisis. Um, it, it's been said that this is um, some of the worst humanitarian uh, or some of the worst drought since the early 1990s. And al-Shabaab is at their worst when they're occupying. Um, so if you put them there uh, in this community with all these people that are fed up with their draconian sense of order and the fact that none of them have any food, perhaps that might be another way that we can break the organization. Uh, and the third point is uh, future cooperation of regional entities. And I'm speaking specifically to Ethiopia and Kenya. Currently, these, uh, these countries are taking, I guess, more a defensive posture along the borders. But uh, the fact remains that Ethiopia will fight to protect its, it, it has an existential security interest in Somalia. And if it needs to, and it believes it must fight, it will do so. Uh, and if this happens, we could uh, descend into the level of chaos that we saw following the 2006-2000 uh, the invasion that uh, Ken had mentioned. Uh, so it's imperative to keep these regional entities on the same page, perhaps, through uh, IGAD. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, there is limited cause for optimism uh, within Somalia, but there are no shortage of questions and concerns going forward. Um, so with that, uh, we open it up. And please feel free to ask about the political questions as well. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to security. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, in the interest of time and uh, so that we can fulfill our contract with the audience to, uh, to wrap up on time, I'll forgo uh, asking any questions as, as a moderator and open it up to the floor. I just ask that you wait for the microphone and that when you get the microphone, uh, you tell us who you are. Uh, so can we start? Why don't we start in the, in the far back, uh, young lady with her hand raised? And then we'll come up to Steve. Hi, Lauren Plock with the Congressional Research Service. Um, question for you, Ken, on the Kampala bombings. Um, interested, you mentioned briefly kind of al-Shabaab's potential, um, you know, potential involvement in Kenya. Um, what, what do you think that the involvement or at least the arrest of non-Somali nationals in Uganda means for al-Shabaab's networking in the region? Um, is al-Qaeda in East Africa still alive? At once why don't one we go time. ahead and take a couple? Why don't we take uh, one from Steve, and then we ha we have another one from uh, yeah, uh, just uh, from DoD. Thank you, uh, Stephen Tankel. Uh, for uh, Professor Mankes, I don't want to um, put words in your mouth, but I believe reading a couple of years ago in in one of your uh, testimonies before on the Hill that uh, that you suggested at that at that time um, members of the Somali diaspora who were going over to Somalia there was there was a there was a concern on the part of al-Shabaab about using them back here in the West because, you, you know, you sort of don't want to spoil your, your, the pool of money. As 
Shabab's popularity has shrank, um, Ethiopia has pulled out. Has that calculation changed? Is that something that you see as more of a concern right now? And then if I could also ask just briefly for uh, Professor Filiu, uh, you talked a lot about sort of Abu Zayed's future ambitions, and I was wondering if you had a sense of what his relationship is with the folks in the north. Um, you know, is he still on the same page with, with Drukdal? Are they fast becoming competitors? If they are on the same page, are, are the folks in the Sahel really able to do anything to support people in the north? Um, or does that relationship not matter so much anymore? Okay, and lastly, a question back here. I'm sorry, the, our fellow from uh, Indy U, right? Thank you. Mary Pat Renstrom. And I, my question really is a Somali based, <coughs> and it is um, in the terror crime nexus that we see unfolding in Somalia. We're looking at a couple of regions, some have stabilized. So, what is the value of looking to recognize Somaliland, let them stand on their own, deal with the uh, border issues with Puntland, and again, allow them some path for autonomy? probably hooking it to making sure they clean up the piracy problem they've got going on. And then how does that provide a method of channeling resources to help stabilize southern Somalia? Okay, and we're going to take one last question from Peter Berger. Uh, just uh, one for Chris uh, Busek here. Um, you know, we, there's a very predictable succession crisis going to happen in Saudi Arabia, uh, probably two in a row, uh, given King Abdullah's health and the age of Prince Nayef, uh, how does that play out uh, in the context of the Arab Spring, and what does it mean, if anything, for Al Qaeda? Okay, do we want to start? Ken, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, the Ugandan bombings uh, last year were very interesting in that uh, all of the Shabab members were non Somali. Um, this caused, as I heard from Somalis, a rift. Uh, Somalis living in East Africa were extremely nervous about the potential crackdown that, that might ensue. Somalis have hundreds of millions of dollars of investments across East Africa, especially in the Kenyan, uh, the Nairobi neighborhood of Eastleigh, but also Mombasa and elsewhere. Um, and, and we're quite upset that these foreigners who uh, appropriated the name Shabab um, engaged in this. It was, however, understood both in Somalia and in the region as something less than an internationalization of Shabab's attacks. Because Uganda's forces are in Mogadishu, there was this implicit understanding this is just an extension of the war in Mogadishu. And I think there was, um, as a result, uh, a, a, a muted response on the part of the Kenyan government. The Kenyan government has also been playing uh, Somalia better, uh, uh, has been focusing much more attention on it as it should, and, 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 and handling its own Somali-Kenyan population better. Um, although I'm a little worried about some of their adventurism in, in southern Somalia right now. They could get their fingers burnt there. Um, as for the question about uh, Shabab recruiting in the U.S. Um, and could that be changing? Thank you for that. Uh, that was something I hit, didn't get a chance to talk about. Shabab is in trouble with recruitment now. Um, uh, the Somali diaspora uh, is no longer under any romantic illusions about this organization. They are not recruiting people. They still have sympathizers. It's hard for some Somalis to criticize them openly because they did play a role in ousting Ethiopia, they, what, what the Somalis believe is ousting Ethiopia. Uh, but but uh, they've got a very bad name in the diaspora. Some of the diaspora who did go over and work with them who've quietly come back um, have said this was not at all what we thought uh, we were getting into. So I think their, their, their reach inside the diaspora is limited. I think there still is the great risk, if they were to send back a sleeper cell, um, that, uh, that it could work against them if they were caught. Uh, we, we would have a, a wealth of information on them. Um, they are mainly now recruiting in Somalia among weak ethnic groups, uh, among the Somalis. Some of it, I'm, I'm told, is virtually coerce conscription. So when you get these stories, like in the Ramadan offensive, 800 Shabab fighters killed, um, and then Shabab reappears with lots more fighters, and Amazon commander saying, where are they getting these kids from? What I'm hearing is they're, they're going into some of the Bantu villages and other places and, and really you know, forcing them to fight and using them as cannon fodder. And this gets out. Somalis talk. Uh, and they're very, very angry about what, what, what they see Shabab is doing. Uh, John, do you want to maybe take very quickly the question yeah. about Somaliland? Exactly. Uh, speaking of that issue, it brings up the, the question of dual track, which we referenced earlier. Um, and for those of you that don't know, dual track is uh, a policy through which the United States is going to engage with regional entities within Somalia, which includes the regional entities of uh, Somaliland and uh, Puntland. Um, the issue here is that it's not just a, a political engagement policy. I think it's also one of military containment. Uh, in the event that the TFG falls apart, it's important that 
we have something. We have some kind of skin in the game. And dual track will allow us to build those relationships uh, with those entities. But as you referenced, there's the, it's a delicate issue because of the territory dispute between uh, Somaliland and Puntland. So speaking specifically to the utility of recognizing Somaliland, they have de facto uh, independence already. Um, so I, I'm not sure how an official re uh, rec uh, recognition is going to affect that, whereas recognition could jeopardize our relationship with Puntland, and they are the northern flank against Al-Shabaab. So if it were up to me, uh, yeah. Now maybe, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, can you address the question about uh, cross Sahel? Uh, uh, cooperation between the networks in yeah. south and north? Well, certainly they are on the same web page mm -hmm. and they cannot disconnect because they are officially part of the same uh, organization. And as you know, Jihadi are very formalist. You cannot, uh, if you do that, it's fitna and you are uh, the worst sin because you introduce, you know, tension and betrayal inside an organization that is supposed to be uh, brotherhood of. Uh, of elite. So of course uh, it, it never appears, which is why also Abu Zaid is playing the way he's playing, because he, he is uh, overflanking uh, Drugdal, who is his commander back in the north, who basically cannot do anything but supporting him publicly, because otherwise he appears that he is a very weak guy. And by the way, the, which, is, there is this which is why there is this puzzling triangle, which is, to my knowledge, and I submit this uh, a comment to you unprecedented in uh, Al Qaeda uh, history because Al Qaeda is playing one sub branch against the leaders of branch. Huh? They don't want to de destabilize Drugdal, but they consider Drugdal is far too Algerian by their standards, you know, and that they prefer uh, much better, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, adventure of Abu Zaid. Drugdal, if he has uh, a preference, of course, it's with Belmortar. They, they, they have been fighting together. They have the same um, background. So at one moment, apparently it's not the case anymore, there were a lot of talks about Drugdal having to leave the north and to take refuge into the side. In that case, he would go with Belmortar. If he goes with Abu Zaid, then you, know, you have uh, a lot of instances of that in Islamic history. You know what will be his fate. He will be a, a king without crown or without throne, or I don't know what. And the guy will, which is why I think from Abu Zaid's point of view, it's more uh, promising to become part of a new organization that would not be a splinter organization, that would prove that jihad is expanding in new land. Huh? Uh, not, you know, acting against his m emir, but as acting as a vanguard, opening new grounds, fatah, you know, a new, a new opening. And in that case, it could work. It would be unprecedented, but it could work. And Chris, finally, if you could weigh in on the Saudi succession question and what it could mean for al-Qaeda. Right. I mean, I think when you look at how the Saudis are managing this Arab Spring, I think they are probably the country that's the best equipped to come out on top, right? $136 billion worth of new spending that comes straight out of the bank that will not affect the economy at all is amazing, right? Meanwhile, we're arguing about $30 billion in deficit measures in this country. Um, I, mean, I think, you know, it's often been said that the Saudis use a combination of three things to fight terrorism, religion, or religious ideology, force, and money. And these are the things that they will continue to deploy, primarily religious ideology and money. Um, when it comes to the, the succession, you know, most likely Prince Naif will be king. Prince Sultan probably will not be king for very long, if at all. Um, Prince Naif, you know, it's oftentimes said has a, a, a good relationship with the, the clerical establishment is, you know, some people say he's too conservative. I think that's probably the kind of person you want running Saudi Arabia, someone who's close to the religious establishment. But if you look at what has been said about um, about him now, you know these are awfully close to the things that were said about King Abdallah when he was prince ten or fifteen years ago. Um, at the end of the day, you know I think Prince Naif has been interior minister for thirty five or so years, and I think looks at a lot of issues through the lens of security. And right now, there are no first level kind of first tier Al Qaeda operatives running around the country. There's certainly a level of sympathy, and if the Saudis let up on what they're doing, it could surge back. Um, but I think, the, I think the Saudis got the message about this, and I don't think the, whoever it is that, that sits on the throne is going to change things for that. And 10 more seconds for Ken Minkhouse. 
Sorry, Laura's question uh, raised a really important issue that we need to flag before we close, and that is uh, the, 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 the existence of the East Africa al-Qaeda cell at this point. We've tended to just focus on Shabab, presume they're conflated. In fact, the, 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 the Kampala bombing plus the rumors that a substantial portion of the non-Somali foreigners in Somalia right now uh, working with Shabab, training there, are from East Africa, raises the issue of, of, of a separate group that has Kenyan or Tanzanian or other agendas, and we need to pay attention to that. We've, we've really let them slip off the radar screen. Well, many thanks to our panel, and I hope, uh, audience, you'll uh, join me in, in thanking these gentlemen for that very impressive set of, of assessments. <laughs> and for the final word of the day, our, uh, our host, Peter Bergen. I just wanted to thank uh, everybody who uh, made this possible. Uh, Andrew Leibovich did most of the actual work. Patrick Doherty, my friend and colleague, did a lot of the other work. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Raylan and Steve Cole uh, were great uh, facilitators of this event. Um, Kirsten Gilbert, Stephanie Gunter, and Hillary on audio. Thank you also. How many people stayed all day? <laughs> my God. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all get some sort of special, uh, sort of special gold star for that. Thank you also to C-SPAN and uh, anybody who's still watching on from the C-SPAN audience after all this. And hopefully we won't have to do this 10 years again, uh, go from uh, 10 years from now, uh, uh, because hopefully Al-Qaeda will not be a subject of public discussion in the way it unfortunately remains. So thank you all.